Cool, okay. Uh, fellas, this one's going to shut you straight off. Uh, anybody seen the film um, Eat, Pray, Love? Eat, Pray, no, 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 you've got to put your hands in the air and you've got to confess. This is time to purge you of those terrible things you've done. Sarah, is this an age thing? No, just checking. Okay, just checking. Yeah, if you've seen Eat, Pray, Love, I haven't, and I'm glad of it. Uh, in 2006, writer Elizabeth Gilbert wrote her memoirs, and it was called Eat, Love, Pray. Uh, it was plugged by Oprah, so it went stratospheric in just about every sort of book column you can possibly have. The film's been made of it with Julia Roberts. Fellas, steer clear of it. It, steer, it, sorry, it, it, it chronicles Gilbert's year of travel and self-discovery after uh, a painful divorce uh, and I suppose it chronicles to a degree her breaking free of the life that she didn't want. I suppose the big message of the film from what I understand of the reviews and the comments and the write-up is it is effectively a, a self-salvation plan by self-discovery. Go deeper into life, go deeper into yourself and at the end of it you get happiness. So she tracks off to the first country where she goes to start off with, those of you who've seen it. You were obviously asleep. Did, did Kosh watch it with you? <laughs> did, he, did he recommend it? <laughs> he bought it! Okay. So what Kosh is denying that he knows is that the first place she goes is to Italy where she just indulges in the pleasures and the senses. Uh, then she goes to India in, in pursuit of spiritual enlightenment. And then Phil and Margaret, she goes to Indonesia and so she finds love and she gets some sort of balance back in her life and this year of travel is financed by her publisher so she writes it all up. Now from the world's point of view, uh, I understand, particularly if you're female, it's a compelling story. Many would say it's very inspiring watching what happens. Uh, the film, I understand, communicates something of a happy ending that this is actually the way to go. So I suppose it's, in some sense it's being held up as a gospel something to be aspired to, so, uh, an answer to some of our issues and problems. And genuinely, there's some great good that comes out of it. You know, she overcomes depression, uh, she finds some sort of spirituality, she finds love with a Brazilian dude called Felipe, um, she gets in touch with herself, whatever that means. Uh, and there was an interview that was done with her just a few years ago, and when she was asked why she did it, she said she was driven by one question. One question. What is it that I really want. See, just like you and me, she had got one life that she was going to spend one way or another, and so have you. And we're really good at spending our life, aren't we? We invest it in something, but the way that she ordered it and tried to pursue that year was saying, what is it I really want? Uh, and I suppose really it just exposes how sometimes fickle we can be. Uh, a little bit vain perhaps, because basically the answer from the book I understand comes back to say, basically, uh, I want good pizza, a lot of sex, and a spirituality that doesn't tell me what to do, that makes me feel less shallow than I really am. Now, I don't know whether she'd articulate it that way. I think that's, so, that's how we'd summarise it. Let me ask you a question. I want some answers from down there, so if you've played that, I want some answers here. Why did the book sell so well? Why did the film do so well? Why did they manage to get Julia Roberts to peddle that story? Why? What, what I've just explained to you meant that it was going to be a bestseller. It's a love story, yeah. And we think that we'll find salvation in love. Brilliant. Good. What else? Sorry? Most people are really unhappy. We have this sense of emptiness that nothing seems to fill. So if somebody tells a story, if I found it, or at least she thought she did, it's going to sell a lot, isn't it? Why else? This idea of empowering myself. So if I look inwards, I can find some answers that will help me move onwards. Yeah, why else? You can have what you want, still be a nice person, and not be told by somebody else what you've got to do. You can come up with your own answers. We like that idea, don't we? We like that. I think this view is, full, uh, is everywhere in the Western world. Uh, we come from a place where we have no beginning and we no, no end and we've got to make the best of it now. We've rejected any idea that there is a true and living God. So what we do is we try to find meaning in our experiences 
and in our sensualities. And it's very now orientated. In fact, what we'll do is we will even pray for self, and we will fill up our longings for the transcendent. And we have that, don't we? A longing for the transcendent. We will fill that up in absence of the real God, the true and living God, the only one who can satisfy. We will fill it up on self-worship or petty idolatry. And then try and persuade the world that we're sophisticated as we do it. Now, I'm not having a, pop, a nice Elizabeth Gilbert, because if it weren't for the Lord Jesus, I would be just as lost and str- uh, struggling, scrabbling around, trying to find what to spend and invest my life upon. And it would be quite intoxicating. That's one of the reasons the book sold so well, the film did so well, was it is intoxicating. We look at other people's lives, we look at our kids' lives, and as we look at them, we know that if you live the life of a spoiled brat who gets everything they want without any cost to it at all, you know that you end up rotten. But each and every one of us really believe that we will be the exception to that rule, so we dive in and pursue and go after what we want. And of course, sometimes we do it respectfully. It's, enough. it's not just me. Probably I'll take all my stuff and I'll give it to the people that I like and are very precious to me and around me. And that's the, the way that that works out. Now, I'm not saying don't look after the ones you're responsible for. But I'm saying that we know how to live an incredibly selfish, my kingdom building world. But can I tell you, that can't be in stronger contrast to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And for those of you who are believers here, you know what that means. Because rather than go inward and on a journey to try and find yourself, what you do is you realise there is one outside of yourself who gone on a journey to come and find you. And his name is Jesus Christ. You no longer look and turn inwards because you know that it's, it's empty. What you do is you look outwards and you see the mercy of a gracious God, Heavenly Father, and the saving action of his son, Jesus Christ, who pierced into space-time history, broke into humanity, and came as the saviour that will pay the price for our wrong and break the power of our broken, selfish, sinful desires. And he doesn't just stop there. He calls the likes of you and me into his kingdom, not to spend our life and fritter it away in our own vain and empty little kingdom-building projects, but to spend our life for him. And that's what Peter was banging on to these little churches and these little out-of-the-way places who were struggling for standing up for Jesus. He says, remember who you are. You're called by the true and living God to spend and use this brief time now, not in the vain and empty attempt to make your life have meaning, but to live under the authority, the grace, the mercy of King Jesus. And if we were a Pentecostal church, everybody would have said, Amen. It's no bit lot if you notice at the end of this section. Amen. Oh, it's Sunday. We're having a heat wave. And we're mostly British. We don't do enthusiasm, don't you know? So here we are. We're at a point where he said, Okay, this is true. How then should you live? And rather than eat, pray, love, three words... Pray, love, serve. Those are the three commands in here. Okay? James, write them down because she thinks they're difficult to remember. I'm really glad you write them down. But let's get everything. Do you think we could manage to say those three words together if we say them slowly? Pray, love, serve. And some of you almost smiled as you did it as if you were appreciative for me pointing this out. Right. Let's move on because we haven't got time to waste. Have a look down at verse 7 and we will read, uh, I'll read that one out loud. The end of all things is near, therefore be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Oh, well done, Steve. Lily, pray. Bless. At least you said it, mate. Kosh didn't. Right. Uh, end of all things. Face facts. Do you understand that very soon you will be in eternity? Oh, I know it doesn't fit. Some of you are like, bring it on, Lord! But very soon we will be in eternity, and it is sooner than you think. So let that one wash over you for a second. And this bit is telling us, order your life if that is true. So fast forward a hundred years from now, and think to yourself, what will be important, precious, vital? What should... What well, I know in a hundred years' time that I don't know now 
that will shape the way I think I live. And my problem here is that I don't want to think like that. And neither do you, do you? We're too busy doing an Elizabeth Gilbert. We're too busy trying to find ourselves, trying to invest ourselves, trying to give us ourselves away to so many things. I don't want to be sober-minded about eternity. I don't want to, where is it, be alert. I never cease to be amazed and surprised as to how sober and alert I can be when it comes to focusing on stuff that I'm interested in. I know how to draw up a wall chart, save my money, get the kids in a car, make a plan. Because if it's something that I'm interested in, which I convinced will meet my needs, or further my pursuit in life, I can be incredibly applied. But being sober-minded and alert to the things of eternity, I find that really easy to forget about it. But you know what? That's the same for you guys too, isn't it? It is. So, I know many of you who are really good at planning holidays, buying presents, installing computers, getting your hair done, arranging childcare, when it's important to you but come to a prayer meeting? Oh, Steve, that's far too hard. Think about things of eternity? I couldn't possibly. Don't ask me to do something like that. I just haven't got the capacity. Oh, please, is what I've got written in my notes. Oh, and next to it, in brackets, I've got, and stop giving me lame excuses. You should be ashamed of yourselves. Is that for anybody out there? Is that for anybody out there? Let's at least be honest with ourselves that the reason we're unfaithful when it comes to matters of eternity is not because we haven't got the time, opportunity or inclination, it's because we're too busy living as if there's no eternity. Isn't that true? I'd have got another amen from the Pentecostals as well, Wes. Listen, I stand here as guilty, but let's at least be honest with ourselves and repent and bring it to the Lord and say, Lord, please give me your vision for eternity that you've got. You're the one who's called me. You've stepped out of eternity into here to drag us into eternity. It must be important. Lord, give me a sense of that same importance, please. Pascal said that the problem wasn't that people don't believe in God, it's that we don't think about God because our mind is elsewhere. Willfully. Willfully. And I'm the same. So let me just lay it on the line. There is a point coming, and it is sooner than you think, when you will open your eyes and you will stand before God. And so much of what we pursue and get worried about won't be there. It won't be important anymore. So that bank statement will be meaningless. That reputation will be insignificant. Whether you got married or didn't get married will not be important anymore. Because you will be with the Lord if you know him as your Lord and Saviour. So what are we supposed to do? Pray, which is the ultimate Christian expression of turning our heart towards the Lord and getting in tune with Him. Not to ourselves, like that poor lady going inwards. There's nothing there. But we lift up to the outwards and we say, Lord, please come. Can I tell you, the Lord smiles when we pray. The reason He puts it in here is because He wants us to do it. Now perhaps this surprises you. The Lord is the kind of God who delights most deeply, not in making demands of us, but on satisfying and meeting needs for us. Can I say that again in case you've missed it? Do you believe this about the character of God? He delights most, not in making demands of us, as if he needs anything from you and me, but by meeting the needs. That's his character. He's like, hello, I'm here, why don't you just ask? Want to get in tune with me? That's why I sent my son. This is something that's quite precious to me. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? See, we are poor and stupid and he is rich and wise. Our souls are to be satisfied in him. We have nothing to offer, nothing but our need. So don't go to Italy or India or Indonesia. You go because you've got good reason. Don't go there to find yourself. You'll find nothing that will last. Go to the Lord in prayer. And listen, I know how easy it is at the end of a busy day or at the beginning of a busy day just to want to escape. Just to want to escape into a tub of ice cream or another 
pointless, needless spell on Facebook or just veg in front of a soap. All of those are little escapes. All of us sort of stop us having sober thinking about the reality of life. I'm not saying those things are necessarily bad. I'm saying that what we use them for can be. So can I just give you a little challenge? You need to plan to do this, otherwise you won't do it. If you do want to have a bit of ice cream, and I certainly do, if you want to go onto your Facebook, if you want to watch a bit of telly, before you do, take a minute. And instead of delivering up your life, your ambition, your, your soul need, your meaning to those things, what you do is you start first of all and say, Lord, I'm yours. Thank you for this day. You know the burdens that have turned to my heart. You know how I've forgotten the plight of the lost and the needs of the many. You know how I've forgotten how, how precious Jesus is. Please, would you just chew me in so that I go there for my rest, so that I can not depend on but enjoy those things that are around, help me relax and chill out. Anybody here not going to watch telly this week? Cool, there's going to be a lot of praying done. Anybody here, well, Facebook, Facebook. Anybody here not going to eat something just to relax and enjoy? Well, in that case, there's going to be oodles of praying done, isn't there? So the first thing we've got here is, verse 7, the end of all things is near, therefore be clear-minded, self-controlled, so that you can pray. So if the first thing was pray, what's the second thing? Jane wrote it down, but somebody didn't write it down. Encourage me. Love. Love. Now let's get this, okay? Verse 8. Above all, love each other deeply. Does that sound like it's pretty important? Above all, love each other deeply. Uh, In another verse, it's um, above all, keep loving one another earnestly. Keep loving. What does that mean in the Greek? Don't stop for any reason. Oh, you've got loads of reasons why you've stopped loving people, haven't you? Some of it is to do with them and what they're like, and some of it is to do with you and what you're facing. Now, this is why this verse is such a shock that Peter is writing to these Christians, above all else, keep loving each other. Because what are they going through at the time? Can you remember from what we've heard before? Encourage my heart. What kind of life would you say they've got? In fact, if you look down at verse 12, it will describe to you what kind of life they've got. What's it say? Have a look. What's it say? Somebody other than Stephen. You're too, you're, do you know you're a preacher's dream, you are? I want to sit you right at the front, okay? Everybody else, become a preacher's dream. Right. What's it say, verse 12? What kind of life have they got? Sorry? Painful. What else? Painful trials. They're suffering. They're having a hard time. And to people who are having a hard time, does he say, well, it's all right, you've got an excuse, you don't need to be as loving as you used to be. That's the opposite, it's shocking you now. So if you're somebody who's been going through a hard time in the last few weeks, this verse is for you. Above all else, this is the way you're going to get through your hard time. Above all else, keep loving God's people earnestly. Is that a shock to you? You see, most of us don't mind loving people when we've got a bit of free time and not got too much to worry about. This turns that on its head. The most important time to be pressing into the lives of other people is when your life is falling apart. Do you like that? No. And this is another bit of the Bible that tells us we are only ever going to be able to obey God's word by the the power of the Holy Spirit in the strength he provides because humanly speaking, that isn't possible. In times of struggle, you must be part of that process that is so near to the, uh, the Lord's heart, which is building community. We have several different strategies when we're, when we're struggling. Number one is we back away. So what we do is we don't answer our text messages, we cancel the dates we've got to meet with people, we don't answer our doors, we don't answer our phones, we become a law unto ourselves, we back away. And what we do is we justify that and we say things like, well, I don't want to be a burden to anybody, or they won't really understand what I'm going through, or I just haven't got the strength to do this right now. So we'll justify it. But you can't get out of this Bible verse that says, keep loving. Keep on going. Keep pressing. In fact, the time when you most need to do it is when you're tempted to back away. So why is it that Steve and Anthony and their elders are always keeping tabs and saying, you've not been around, you've not been around. Because you not being around is usually 
either a mark of um, ill health or confused spiritual priorities. Vast majority of the time, either ill health or confused spiritual priorities. Then again, there's other people who, when they're suffering, they're a little bit different. What they do is they say, um, I'll do the independent model. I will make a plan and I will come up and I will fix it myself. And when I've got myself in order, that's when I'll gather with the community of people, of God's people. That's not how you became a Christian. You came a, became a Christian when you realised, and you were at your end of yourself, and you realised how needy you were. Now you've become a Christian, don't go back to the old strategy of trying to fix your own life. I will come along to church when I've got all my ducks in a row. I will gather and press into the lives of people when I'm doing okay. No! Keep loving people earnestly. Now that word earnestly, or what's in the NIV, the version you've got there, uh, it says, hold on, um, uh, deeply, there's only one other place in the whole New Testament where that word is used. It's in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before Jesus died, when he prayed earnestly. And how does it describe his physical state at that point? Sweating as great drops of blood. What's this bit saying? Love people till you bleed. Now I can't ask that to somebody who's not a Christian. Because this isn't morality. This is spirituality. This is... You'll only get a desire to do that through the spirit of the living God. To say, Steve, how dare you stand? I'm just telling you what God's word says. I'm just telling you what it says. So we need to be honest with ourselves. Some of us don't want this verse in the Bible. We don't want to see our sins or or get so close to people that our sins get shown off. Uh, Sometimes we push each other's buttons and when we get close to each other, and this is particularly difficult when you're going through a struggle, what happens is, is we start oozing out of ourselves and rather than saying, help me, what we do is we say, I'll go back and hide and try and put on a, a, a reasonable effect. Listen, in this church family, everybody who's confessed Jesus has confessed that they are a sinner and hopelessly trapped, hopelessly trapped and enslaved in their sin and needs the community of God's people to help grow. So don't back away. Look at what love does. It overcomes weakness and failure. You can see it there in verse 8. Because love covers over a multitude of sins doesn't mean we can do what Jesus did, which is pay for sins. But what love does is it overlooks sins. It bears with people who are struggling. What love does is it looks at somebody who has been a bit mean, grumpy, grouchy, or even done something cruel against you, and rather than back away or yell at them and be angry, what it does is it says, I love you. doesn't mean that might not have to be addressed, but it says, I love you and will move towards you for your good, rather than back away and be angry, bitter, and ret- retreat into my own little house. No, when you find somebody in God's, uh, amongst God's family who, is, who you find difficult, that's actually a prompt for you to move towards them. <laughs> so let's get practical. Because verse 8 does. Sorry, verse 9 does. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Don't you like the first half of the verse and not the second? Offer hospitality without grumbling. Do you know what the definition of hospitality is? It's the art of making someone feel welcome in your home when you wish they were in theirs. That's hospitality. We've got the Phil Mac, we've got Phil and, the, um, and Margaret and, and all the Mac kids. They're hard work. They eat me out of house and home. Can I sh- assure you that wonderful little Caleb, he doesn't know, just know how to speak Indonesian. When he wants chocolate, he knows how to speak English. Yes. No, you guys, you're very welcome. And we don't grumble. Bless you. Don't come back for three years. But let's be careful that we understand hospitality isn't just having people into your... Oh, by the way, command, so if you're a Christian here and you haven't invited people into your life recently, then you're being disobedient. There's some families here who have the means, who have the space, who have the opportunity, but you wouldn't dream of inviting people into your life. That's sin. Repent of it and make a plan to be obedient to the Lord Jesus. Okay? But what we've been told here is, invite people into your life, that you can share your life and share your blessings. It is so concrete. So my question to you today is this. 
How are you going to open your life to people for their good this week? Right, I'm stopping now, just for a second. Answer that in your mind now. Don't listen now and go, oh, that's a good idea. And nothing happens. This week, how are you going to obey this? How are you, who are you? And how are you going to invite somebody into your life and move towards them for their good? Tell me now. How are you going to do it? Oh, Steve, do you know what? I, I don't mind if you preach the Bible, but leave us to decide whether or not we listen and obey. Oh, Steve, don't use rhetorical oratory to put me on the spot so I might actually have to think about doing what the Bible says. Don't do it, Steve. It's rude. But I'm not happy about it. Stop interfering with my life. I take it you're here because you want to sit under God's word and you want to grow and change. So I'm asking you again, this week, this week, because of the love of Jesus, who are you going to invite into your life for their good? Wasn't it a wonderful example of what Phil and Mark were doing in an orphanage? And how they get out on the streets and how they get to know people and they go to work. Oh, I'm too busy. Too busy, can't do it. Amen, sister. You always have room for one more. Couldn't agree more. Some of you are like, right, I'm going to downsize, prove her wrong. <laughs> okay. Oh, Steve, move on now, will you? Move on. You put me, you put me on the spot too much now, Steve. Move on, will you? Okay. I'll just tell you this. Jesus Christ invited me to his banqueting table. And at his cost, he provided food and wine without limit. And he says to me, come. Isaiah 55. Come. Come. And eat. What has cost you nothing. That's what we as believers do. We open and share our lives, not just our homes, our lives, because we've got a vision for the good of other people. We love them. So, Jane, what, where, where were we up to on our three points, please? Where were we up to? Sir, right, I've got to do this really quick because I'm running late, okay? We want to make sure as many of you, we want all of you to stay back to Phil Mac and Margaret, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to cut this short. I will do a less than... Uh, 32 minute sermon which is a real rarity around here right sir let's read verses 10 and 11 together Uh, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms if anyone speaks he should do it with one speaking the very words of God if anyone anyone serves he should do it with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. So here's your image, okay? Think of a human body. And by the way, God's people at church are described as as a human body, each with a particular part to play. Let's say down here there's an itch. An itch, you're irritated. Okay? Message goes up to the brain. Brain, I have an itch. What does the brain do then? Does the brain scarper off down there and itch it? What does the brain do? Tells your fingers down your arm to move, do something like this, and hopefully rather discreetly, so that everything's got please. Okay? When we speak to the Lord and we talk about our needs as a church family together, what he does is he uses the body to meet those needs. Can you see that dispensing God's grace in its various forms? Let's hope that we haven't got any deadbeat fingers who can't be bothered to do what the the brain says because otherwise we all suffer. So what we're being told here is that every believer has gifts that can be used. I know some of you go, what's my gift? Think of it like a pie. Okay? Think of it like a pie and in this pie there's just a whole stack of natural gifts and abilities and spiritual gifts and spiritual abilities that you've been, that, 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 that are given into your life. And what they'll be is they'll, they'll sort of be shaped in different ways. So a big chunk of the gifts that I've got, a big chunk of my pie, 
is to do with speaking the word publicly. That's just the way I've been. Am I still supposed to offer hospitality? Yes. Am I still, still supposed to lend a hand and do dishes? Yes. Am I? Is that the main chunk of what I do? No. The main chunk of what I do is speaking. Now, in the same way, you have got a pie. Your pie will be a mixture of speaking for the Lord and serving people for the Lord in the church family. And we're all wired really differently. So, you know, we have to get to know each other to know how much of which pie you've got. But can I tell you that every single one of your resources, your finances, your giftings, your opportunities, your experiences, your locations, you think that's yours. It's not. It's been given to you by the Lord. Can you see that there in that verse? Each one should use whatever gift he has been given to serve others faithfully, administering God's grace in its various forms. So you are supposed to use your time, energy, talent, money, resources, opportunity, learning, skills, energy, whatever it is, experience, whatever it is, not to build your kingdom, but to serve God by serving his people and the community around He has not given you the things we're talking about for you. So if I speak, and the thing that I'm using it to do is further my potential opportunities, then what I'm doing is being disobedient to the Lord. I should speak to further his priorities and serve you lot. I'm not given my gifts and abilities to make much of me. And you're not given your gifts, abilities, opportunities, skills, finances, money to make much of you. It's for who? Well, it tells us in verse 11. If anyone serves, you should do with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. I'm constantly amazed at my ability to change these verses so that I speak words for me and I serve when I choose and in my strength. No wonder it's so easy, easy to become frustrated and struggling. Because we're using stuff that's been put in our hands and we're stewarding it, not for his purposes, but for ours. And he'll only allow us to do that for so long before things start to create cracks. So what is this, this section saying? It's saying, don't waste your life. Serve. Serve. And some of you are sitting there going, I, I can't do it. I don't want to do it. It's hard to do Amen. It's hard to do. But notice what word I just said. Amen. This is the way you know you're a Christian. The way you're a Christian is you listen to that and you say, for the love of Jesus, for the glory of his kingdom, for the value and and worth that he has bestowed in calling this unlikely bunch of people together, for that, that's what I want my life to be. I don't want to be eat, love, pray in Italy and with Felipe. I want to be on task using this short, brief life I've got, knowing that the time is short, I want to use it for Jesus. And everybody who's a believer shouts really loudly, Amen! So as I walk down this way, three questions, very specific. I've left you no wriggle room. Number one, when are you going to pray this week? Before what thing that you usually rush off to? When? If you don't decide now, you won't do it. You don't slip into sober thinking. Number two, who are you going to invite into your life? Just forget next week, this week. Forget last week if you failed. Christ has covered it and he calls you for this week and he calls you for today. Thirdly, how are you going to serve? Not next week, this week. How are you going to pray love and serve. I've got one song we're going to sing now. It's about the greatness of our God, about how undefeatable he is, about how worthy he is, and how soon we're going to meet him. So answer those three questions as you stand and get ready to sing this song. Let's stand together, shall we?